thank you so much for being here today. Uh, my name is Crystal Holmans. I'm a neurodivergent rebel. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about the structure of this presentation before we dive in too deeply. Uh, so I'll talk first kind of about who I am and where I've been in my journey uh, as a light, late diagnosed autistic adult. And I've structured this program a little bit like TV in the old days, I'm myself a little bit here, where, you know, the easy, accessible for everyone programming is on first, and it gets a little later and later in the evening, and the topics get a little more intense. So my program is kind of structured in that way. It'll be real light and fun at the beginning. I'll then kind of move on to talk about sensory overload. And the final topic, and I've put it at the very end of the presentation, because for some people it's just too much, and I won't be offended if you step out before I start to talk about self-harm and some of those more destructive stimming behaviors and kind of shine a light on that. So that's, sorry, so, um, so that's, that's going to be at the end. And before I get too far into the presentation, I'm always curious, are there any autistic or neurodivergent people in the room who are willing to raise your hand and help yourself? Yes! Yes! Thank you! Nobody wanted to help themselves when the first time I gave this talk. I was like, okay. Sometimes I'm the only one in the room. Sometimes I think people don't want to admit it, and that's cool. It's just stigma, unfortunately. And sometimes people might not know. You know, I didn't know for almost 30 years. Curious, do we have more teachers? There are a lot of teachers here all day. Okay, great. Teachers. Good, good, good. Doctors? Okay, awesome. Disclaimer on the doctors, because I have a bad doctor in my story, and I know not all doctors are bad doctors. <laughs> um, do we have our parents and family members here? Thank you so much. That's our, you're our support network, so you're very important. I'm very glad you were all here today. Thank you. So, you know, what is autism? Autism is defined as a lifelong neurodevelopmental condition that impacts social interaction and the way the brain interprets and processes sensory information. But, this definition is rather cold, medical, and stale. I have found that often, medical interpretations of autism remove much of what is good, human, and even beautiful about the autistic experience. The biggest regret's not buying a clicker with working in there. <laughs> so I'm going to be bending over while they doing this. Okay. So I realize you know what autism is, but please just indulge me today because I'm going to redefine autism through my own lens without all that medical and pathologizing language. Because despite my difficulties, I love being autistic. And I would never want to give that up. But let's talk numbers for a second. The CDC estimates that 1 in 59 babies are born autistic. It is estimated that 3.5 million people in America alone are estimated to be autistic. But these numbers do not include people who are self-diagnosed, undiagnosed, or have no idea, like I said earlier, that they're even autistic. Because I didn't know for almost 30 years. And then these numbers, they've been rising recently. But it's not that there are more autistic people here. We've been improving our understanding of autism. And the diagnostic criteria has improved. But unfortunately, we really have a lot of work to do still. 35% of autistic young adults between the ages of 19 and 23 have not held, had a job or received postgraduate education after high school. And these numbers are from the National Autism Society website on the facts and statistics tab if anyone wants to go dig deeper into those. So who am I? I'm autistic, and I don't think that makes me defective or broken. I believe that I have a different type of mind, and it allows me to view the world with unique and fresh perspective. 
This idea is controversial because autistic people also have weaknesses. Autistic weaknesses have been very well documented over the years, but it is a history that has been written from people who are examining autism from the outside. We've all got weaknesses, but having your weaknesses defined and outlined in a medical textbook in detail, it's a bit shocking and a little bit dehumanizing as well. And then, this is what gets me. Why no mention of the positives? There are definitely some outsides. And unfortunately, they're generally given less discussion time than the deficits. I'm a whole person. I am more than just my weaknesses. I'm a combination of both my strengths and my weaknesses. And having that intense focus on my weaknesses, I can tell you from personal experience, that is not good for anyone's health, mental health. And autistic self-esteem, and really for anyone, is essential for success. So, you know, for the autistic people that you encourage, or that you encounter, I'm, I'm begging you, please be an encourager. We really don't need help focusing on our weaknesses. We're programmed with a desire to fix problems. Don't turn us into a problem that needs to be solved. I have a, I have a fun activity, okay? This will be a mental, imaginary, in your head exercise. I would like for everyone in the room, and it's a live stream, there's a Facebook live stream going, everyone listening to think of your top three to five biggest strengths and get those in your head for a minute. I'm going to give you some time to think of your top three to five biggest strengths. And you know, if you have more strengths than that, sure, think of those two. Uh, you, you can give many strengths as you, as you can come to easily. <coughs> so everybody got some strengths in their head? They know what they're good at? You know what you're good at? You know more time? Okay, so the next part though, think about those weaknesses. But for the weaknesses, I don't want more than two or three, even if you have more. Because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to enforce that thought pattern where we're just so focused on our weaknesses all the time. I do want to say that it is important to be aware of our weaknesses and to know them, but that's not the same as just obsessively trying to fix them. So, you've got those strengths and weaknesses, right? What if I came here and told you today, those strengths, those weaknesses, those things that make you you, that's part of a disease. Something unacceptable. How does that make you feel? It's a miracle I haven't tripped over this microphone. We'll see. Hopefully it won't happen today. All right, that diagnosis, it took a while to sink in. But once I accepted it, and I stopped fighting my autistic nature, and most importantly, learned a bit of self-compassion, my life did get better. I couldn't grow while I was so busy beating myself up over my weaknesses and shortcomings. So it's hard to pin down a good number for this one, uh, but depending on the source, it's estimated that 20 to 30% of autistic people do use little to no verbal speech. This does not mean they cannot communicate. This does, I'm gonna say that again, this does not mean they can't communicate. That's really important. However, it's a myth that autistic people cannot be articulate. I've been highly verbal most of my life. In fact, for me, knowing when to stop talking 
is a pretty big problem. I can get up here, be on the stage, I can monologue, ramble on, talking about anything that catch my interest for a long time. But then you take me off this stage, and there's that simple act of back and forth communication. That's still hard for me, even now in my 30s. I'm not sure that's ever going to change. It's frustrating because everyone else makes it look so easy. I stand out, and I've been standing out my entire life. I need freedom. Freedom to be myself, freedom from demands, freedom from people's expectations. There really isn't anything that makes me more miserable than trying to blend in. And when I was diagnosed autistic in my late 20s, I decided I wasn't hiding anymore. Let's go way, way back. Between the ages of one and a half to two years old, I loved dinosaurs, and dinosaur books. And I taught myself to read. On one road trip, my ability to read cities on a Texas map brought surprise and delight to the adult sitting in the front seat. Ooh, she's reading. When did that happen? Okay, that's interesting. You know? Mm. Then, you know, a little bit later, I was about three, we were at a family gathering. And one of the adults, we will call him Ray, to protect his privacy, he made the comment that talking to Krista is like talking to a real person. <laughs> but he, you know, he meant that I had an advanced way of speaking and an advanced vocabulary for a child of three, you know, that young. Of course, my response to him was, I am a real person! Because I was, you know, uh, of course I'm a real person. But growing up, you know, I was the, uh, the smart kid, too smart for my own good, kind of smart. I was always getting in trouble because adults around me felt like I should have known better. But I didn't, I didn't. You know, I was just as immature as the rest of the kids. And I always, always needed answers and questions everyone and everything around me. I've also always had a very strong need to do things my own way. Sometimes to the confusion and frustration of those around me watching from the outside. Although, you know, adults often were impressed with that advanced vocabulary, my continued questioning, avoidance to demands, and constant use of the phrase why? Got me in trouble. Often. Especially at school. In the first grade, I was already struggling. I remember my mother's anger and frustration with teachers who just didn't know what to do with me. My behaviors in class were disruptive. My ways of coping the busy classroom, my stimming, was distracting, and it was a problem. The school was pressuring my mother to put me on ADHD medication. This was back in the 90s, and at that time, that particular diagnosis was gaining a lot of awareness. There's Nothing wrong with that child. My mother raised her voice to the teacher. She was mad. And she was right. There was nothing wrong with me. To add, I didn't know that fact about myself yet. I wouldn't truly figure that out until I had fully accepted my autism di diagnosis in my early 30s. Also, as a side note, because I really feel obligated to throw this in there, 
I am not saying there's anything wrong with anyone who's got ADHD. Actually, some of my absolute favorite human beings have been and are throughout my life ADHDers. And a lot of them, although they do tend to be a lot better at picking up on the social cues and the timing and conversation, they relate to many of the same experiences, especially relating to school. Also, I don't want to shame anyone who takes any appropriate medical or medication, okay? But the point is, I don't have ADHD. That would not have been appropriate at all for my situation. School was hard and it really didn't get any easier. I pretty much spent the entire time, I remember, marking off the calendar, waiting for it to be over every year and counting down because I knew at the end of 12th grade I wouldn't have to go anymore. I hated my childhood, mostly because of school. I just wanted to be an adult the whole time. <laughs> and then senior year, my economics teacher let me know that she had bumped me up to a passing grade, mostly because she just didn't want to deal with me anymore. But that was great because I was done with her too. And I had already started a full-time job. I was the assistant manager for a popular fast food drive-in restaurant chain. And I was ready for work and the future. School was behind me. And at least at work, they paid you for that time you put in. And although I had struggled in school, in the workplace, I came alive. I was confident in the clear direction of my tasks. And my coworkers, now that I was no longer looking for friendships and relationships, we were just people working on a project towards the same goal. That was easier for me. I learned to love and even look forward to work. And work was and still is one of my special interests. I have to put a big air quote up here. And actually, I'm going to pause and talk about pathological language a minute because special interests. I hate that term. I hate it. I think passion is a much better term. I'm passionate about the workplace, autism, and office culture. When a non-autistic person has an area of expertise, it's not pathologized. And that laser focus is one of the biggest and most well-known autistic strengths. We can focus for hours upon hours when we're passionate about something. During that period of laser focus, in our area of expertise, we can do amazing things. It really makes me sad when I hear autistic passion described using that pathologizing language. Obsessed, fixated, repetitive behavior. Autistic passion is where innovation happens. Deep thinkers, looking towards the future, covering all the details. Remember that story about the dog bowl this morning, that detail? People on Facebook are like, what? <laughs> Autistic people, we're not afraid to think differently. We just do it naturally. And we look at the problems from a different angle. Before I was diagnosed, I finally landed what I thought was my dream job. It was one of those hip and trendy offices, and I was lucky enough to work remote three to four days a week. It was great. But as the years progressed, my employer's needs changed. And so I started coming into the office more and more. By the time I left that job, I was only working remote one or two days a week. And I was really 
just beginning to settle in. When we move, say a building, upstairs to a new suite, and all of a sudden I found myself completely disrupted. In the old office, before the move, I sat in this quiet little corner with natural lighting. And in the new office, as the team started to grow, we also had fluorescent lighting, which is something I didn't have in my old office. And I found myself on rotation at the front desk, too. So a few months after that move, I started to see a decline in my health. I was feeling nauseated almost constantly. My weight dropped from about 120 to about 95 pounds fairly quickly. And I was having almost daily migraines anytime I went to the office. I tried really hard to explain to my GP that I had been through this before, but I told her, I don't think this is IBS. I pleaded. I'm not even sure the problem's really in my stomach. When they told me I had IBS growing up, it was because they were out of ideas, and technically my stomach seemed fine. Have you tried this new diet? She asked. If you have IBS, I, it really helps everyone. I, I'd really like you to try it. She didn't listen. What did I say? No, well, I, I don't know why. That, that diet really, really did a lot more harm than good. And I did eventually fire that GP. I went back to her a few times before I fired them. And she eventually recommended that she thought maybe what I was dealing with was anxiety. So, okay. I had also recently read something online that was by an autistic adult, and it really resonated with me. So I said, would it be okay if you refer me to someone who has experience with autism? And she said, you know, I really don't think you are autistic. But then she gave me the phone number for the local chapter of the National Autism Society. So I called them up and asked for people who had experience with autistic adults. And I picked one who had experience with autism and anxiety. So it was a two-part appointment. And the first part, I came prepared with some pages of tight notes and questions. The doctor was very warm and friendly. We filled out paperwork, I answered her questions, and she reviewed baby tapes that I brought in with me. I'm really fortunate I was a very well-documented child. <laughs> Autism, it's a lifelong difference. And even though I didn't know it, I was autistic in the 20-something years before I was diagnosed. Although my presentation and the ways in which I cope and interact with the world may change, I'll always be autistic. So for that autism diagnosis, it is essential those traits have been present since childhood. After I went home, the doctor reviewed the information and then called my grandmother to find out even more about my early life and development. A few weeks later, I returned for my second appointment, and this time it was a lot less work on my part. She gave me a printout of her, of her findings summary, and also included all the notes from the conversation she had with my grandmother. I was autistic. <laughs> then I read that paper twice, and I read through the paper shredder at work, because it was really obvious to me that my grandmother didn't know I would read the things that she had said, and she didn't know anyone else would either. We all these deep, dark family secrets. I learned a lot about my family, though, from that paper. <laughs> the doctor and I spoke about my struggles, work, and accommodations. I'm really glad that she recommended books by autistic authors. And she also didn't paint autism as something that was wrong with me. 
I had been burning myself out, and I was really drowning in low self-esteem as I tried to hold myself up to the impossible standards of the not, my non-autistic peers and coworkers. A doctor, she really set me on a great path. Although I really wish she'd given me more of the information about sensory processing, but thank goodness I finally uncovered the secret to my life. Autism. Before I was diagnosed, it was as if everyone around me knew all the rules, social rules mostly. But I didn't. Someone forgot to tell me these rules. But I was still expected to know them. And then the information that I learned from other autistic adults shook my entire worldview. Suddenly, my eyes were open. I finally found my rule book. Autistic rules, 5.0. But it was more than just a rule book. It really was the answer to everything. I've always, always been driven by questions. I need answers. And it's very hard for me to stop when I haven't found those answers yet. I would say that my autism diagnosis answered about 80 to 90 percent of the questions that I had had floating around in my head about life, the world, and myself for years. Although I am still asking why, and once I put those first questions to bed, and then I started to dig around and learn more about autism, my mind was very quickly filled with many, many <coughs> more questions. And I still have new questions each and every day, even now. So I found the answers to many of my questions on the internet, primarily searching three hashtags. The first one is actually autistic. And this is kind of how I just start stumbled, stumbled across autistic adults on the internet. Um, there's a lot of autistic people on Twitter, kind of random, but it's true. Um, and that hashtag, I encourage everyone to read it and learn and search for it. It is intended for autistic people to use to find one another. So don't tweet in it, please, or use it if you're not autistic. It's a bit like our bat signal. <laughs> we have a bit of an issue where it's very difficult online to find autistic voices. Google's search results really prioritizes big organizations and you know, medical organizations and things like that, not the people with the lived experience. So the other tag, because actually autistic is intended for autistic people, and there was a need for people who want to be our allies to be able to engage with our community, asking autistics. I think this tag has been around for about two years now. And autistic people, parents, everyone uses it. It's, it's really active on Twitter. And then the other one that's been around a while is neurodiversity. And this difficulty, finding other autistic voices, was really, really frustrating to me. Frustrating to me. Because everywhere I looked, there were non-autistic people telling me I was broken. But I didn't feel broken. So, I started a blog. I purchased NeuroDivergentRebel.com on WordPress using their basic plans, and I started sharing my thoughts. I didn't even talk about autism at first. Honestly, I didn't know how to talk about autism or being autistic when I was first diagnosed. I just didn't even have the vocabulary yet. But at one point, and it's very hard to pinpoint, something changed. It was as if a mental block had been lifted, and I knew what to say. I felt compelled, obligated to say it. When I started my blog, my tagline was, 
rebelling against a culture of assimilation over individuality. It's a lot of symbols. Some days I'm happy to just come down my mouth with coherent words. <laughs> I'm still rebelling. But I do like to think that I refine what I do a bit. Two and a half years ago, I was just Krista, a girl who's always been way too hard on herself. Now, I'm the neurodivergent rebel. I'm proudly and unapologetically autistic. I amplify autistic voices, and I really hope to show the world that autistic is just another way of being. But it isn't always easy. Unfortunately, as many neurodivergent people know, this modern world isn't always designed for us. So most autistic people have sensory differences in at least one or maybe more of the senses. Any of the, the senses can be heightened or dulled. So autistic people can be overly sensitive or overly or utterly sensitive in any other senses. And the other thing that's important to note is that autistic sensory differences can vary greatly from one individual to the next. So, you know, for example, you know, something that most people can ignore too, like sounds or light, and that can be so painful to someone who has a sensory issue. Or, you know, there are things that I might find are just totally awesome to look at. Oh my gosh, I love this. This is great, it's shiny. But for someone with a different sensory difference, I've had people tell me, this stuff is painful for them. They can't look at this. They can't sit in steric glitter. That's overwhelming. So that's what's really important to remember is, you know, what one autistic person likes might be another autistic person's nightmare. So there are seven senses. These are the first five that people think about and know about. And there's seven I'm going to go into today. Um, so hearing, like I said, may be more sensitive to sounds or maybe less sensitive to sounds. Auditory processing is a very big part of that. So for me, you know, it's where the brain, how it's supposed to be processing words, and it chooses not to. Sometimes, especially if I'm feeling tired, overworked, worn down, or it's a loud or a very busy environment, my brain just doesn't pick up and process the words correctly. It can skip words. A wrong word might be substituted in place of another word. Or sometimes it can sound a bit like the teachers from Charlie Brown. Womp, 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 womp. Words? Are you making one? I guess you must be making one. I don't hear any words. Touch is a sense that can be really hard for parents because some autistic kids Hugs, kisses, those things that parents can thrive on can be physically painful and overwhelming. I'm not one of those kids. I have always loved the pressure of a deep bear hug. Squeeze me. But don't come up and touch me and surprise me and don't like give me any kind of light touch. No. And I'm easy to start off too. So you do that and I'm gonna like jump out of the skin real quick. So smell, heightened or lowered sense of smell. Taste, talking about autistic food sensitivities because this is a big topic. Sometimes it's taste. Someone can be overly sensitive to taste or underly sensitive to taste. I'm a bit under sensitive to taste, so what that looks like for me is I seek out really bold and flavorful foods most of the time. And if I try to eat something that's bland, I'm gonna gag usually. I'm not, I'm not about bland food. I need a lot of flavor in my food. Despite the fact that sometimes all these spicy things don't even agree with my digestive system, but it's so yummy. And vision lighting is a really big one to me. I hinted at this earlier when I was talking about you know, the fluorescent lighting in the office. So for me, you know, that, that lighting sensitivity, you know, there's blue light and it can be in phones, computers, TVs, it's everywhere. And then there's also this fluorescent lighting. It's not just that. But there's you know those big fluorescent lights that you see at Walmart and a lot of the big stores. There's a lot of offices and big public spaces. If I have prolonged exposure to that, I start to get those migraines. 
I start to get dizzy. I can be anxious and just feel really unwell. And see, I had all that going on before I was diagnosed, and I just thought everybody dealt with it. I didn't, you know, I didn't know there was anything different going on with me. And then we have two senses that people don't know about or don't talk about as often. So the first one, the vestibular sense, is our relation, like our, our, our body's relation to gravity and movement. So I'm a bit clumsy, I'm probably gonna, I'm surprised, I can't believe I have not unplugged this yet today. It is a miracle. Uh, and then the other one, proprioception, this is fun. So we'll do a little exercise with this one. Everyone close your eyes, and I want you to pick a hand, and keep your eyes closed, take your pointer finger, and I want you to touch your opposite ear lobe, with your finger, and then while keeping your eyes closed, I want you to take that finger to your tip of your nose. And if any of you have any difficulty with that, proprioception is that sense that lets us know where our body is in gravity, or our body is in space, even when our eyes are closed. So like the first time I did that alone by myself in the room, I went, oh, touch the tip of your nose. No, oh, that's not my nose. <laughs> I practice nothing, get it, you know, or it's like, okay, well, listen to the, that's proprioception. So I have another activity. I like, I like imagination. I was really, really imaginative. So has anyone ever gone to a movie marathon? Or did anyone see Titanic in the movie theater when that came out? Or any other really long movie? And then have you ever walked out from that long movie at between 1 and 3 in the afternoon on a day when there's not a single cloud in the sky. What's that feel like in your eyes? It's horrible, right? It's like a stabbing feeling almost. So that feeling there, that's that feeling I get anytime I go out when the sun's even out a little bit, that's how it feels. There are, when I go to Walmart, I don't have my sunglasses on, that's how it feels, always. And like I said, I've been around for so many years, just like, oh, well, you don't wear sunglasses inside, it's not acceptable. I didn't know. I just thought everyone was like, oh, you just deal with it. So that perspective is really important to have. <coughs> so the other activity, we're going to talk a little bit about auditory processing. And this one I'm really going to make you close your eyes and imagine, okay? So I want everyone to think about your favorite restaurant and maybe your best friend, or one of your close friends. And you're sitting at a small table with your friend at the restaurant, and you're real close to each other. I want you to think about what you're gonna order to eat. Mmm, my favorite food. Now, think about all the little sounds in the restaurant, okay? So we have people talking. We might have a phone at the front ringing. There might be forks scraping on plates, and there may be someone in the back of the house, you might hear the metal sink and dishes are clanking, okay? So what if then, all of those little sounds all over the restaurant, all of a sudden the volume was elevated, and it's all the exact same level now. People talking, people chewing their food, phones ringing, all of this stuff, it's all one level included, and your friend's talking to you. Her voice at the same level of all that, too. And you can't hear a word she's saying. That's why I don't like to go to busy restaurants or any, any place at peak hours. I don't. I will avoid it as much as possible. Everything is just really loud, too busy, and I'm really only comfortable when I have complete control over my sensory environment. So, all sensory information, regardless of where it comes from, is processed in the brain. I want to think of the brain like a computer. And so if you start opening every application your computer has, and then you start opening window after window after window of tabs of YouTube videos, and play them all, eventually that computer is going to start to kind of slow down. It's probably going to glitch out. Ooh. And <laughs> it'll probably not behave the way you would hope and expect it to. So sensory overload happens when someone is taking in 
more sensory information than their brain can sort out and process at that time. And really, anyone can experience a sensory overload, but they're more common amongst autistic people, people with sensory processing differences, and a few other select medical conditions. And so if there is too much information, and then your brain is already running at less than optimal efficiency, or if you're under stress, the brain can really get stuck, and it doesn't know what information it needs to prioritize. And then, this is the fun part, fun, sarcastic. In order to protect itself, the brain sends this signal <laughs> Run away! Get away from whatever's overloading it. And that triggers the body's fight or flight response. So that's adrenaline. The brain is just pouring out that adrenaline, okay? And has anyone here ever had a panic attack? Knows what that's like? It's a bit like a panic attack. That's the closest thing I can relate it to. So that's really not pleasant. And if you're having a panic attack, can you think clearly? Okay, so we already are in a situation where it's very hard to think clearly. And then we've got adrenaline dumping into the system, making it even harder to think clearly. So this, this can be a really, really intense situation. And so that's why you get that message. That's the one message you get loud and clear. Run! Run! Get away! That's it. So we'll talk about what it looks like and a few of the signs that you could see or know if someone's in sensory distress. So some very common signs would be, you know, just a general feeling of anxiety, restlessness, irritability, or unease. It's kind of the first sign for a lot of people. You may have that urge to escape that I mentioned. And another one kind of that's a big sign for me that I need to rest is if all of a sudden things that don't really bother me are bothering me, like the lights seem brighter than even normal, or like sounds all of a sudden sound really loud. Or maybe my clothes will start to feel like fire ants are biting me all over. That that's kind of a, that's a good sign. Like if the sensory system is kind of flaring up, freaking out, it might be a good time to kind of take a step back. So if you believe someone's experienced sensory experiencing sensory overload, first the environment. I want you to think really hard about the environment and get them to somewhere safe and quiet, or create a safe and quiet space where you are. It's even better if possible. Avoid any place that's loud, busy, or bright. And you know that that includes like, you know, maybe turn off the overhead lights in the room. Turn down or off the music if you've got music on. Really, really important though, and this is something people don't always know, do not touch someone who is having sensory overload without permission. Remember how I was talking about touch and hugs and things and how that can be overwhelming for some people? That can, that can make sensory overload a lot worse for people who are touch sensitive. And remember how I said sensations that might not normally bother you might become overwhelming? Same kind of thing. Even if someone doesn't normally have an issue with touch, if they're in sensory overload, you know, their system may be doing some things that they're not normally even used to dealing with. So make sure you don't touch someone without permission. And the other thing, too, is, you know, sometimes when someone is going through sensory overload, they might have difficulty processing spoken language if you're talking to them. So if you are going to use spoken language with someone who's having overload, Keep it real short and simple, yes or no answers that they can nod and respond to. But really, if you can not talk to them, just let them calm down and recalibrate and get their brains you know, going, that's better. Don't force someone who's in overload to communicate with you. And the other thing is, you know, they may also have difficulty communicating. Sometimes when people have sensory overload, they can lose the ability to speak. And just remember that the person's brain isn't functioning properly. And that really can create danger when you're around strangers or in public spaces. There's 
there's just this huge risk, a huge risk of misunderstanding. Think about when you have someone who's acting aggravated, and then they're also struggling with feeling disoriented. So, it's really important to know what to do when that situation happens. So I want to talk about staying regulated and safe, and then how we can prevent overloads, and then also, because I said, you know, sometimes they're inevitable, they do happen, and so what to do, you know, once that does become imminent. So my first advice would be, if, if you know your prone to sensory overload, learn your triggers. Learn them. Learn to recognize them. Everybody's different. So pay really close attention to all your experiences. Take notes. Look for things that they have in common. And once you do know those triggers, try to avoid what causes problems. Get plenty of rest. Eat. Stay hydrated. Just basic stuff. But your brain needs all you know, food and water and sleep and all of these things to work. <coughs> efficiently. So take care of all that stuff. And you know if possible, when you go somewhere, ask them, hey, can you can we turn the lighting, can we turn some of these lights off? Can we turn that music down a little bit? If people aren't being total jerks, they'll oblige you. <laughs> Sometimes people are jerks and we'll be like, deal with it. Okay, I'll make fun. <laughs> you know. Uh, but that's the other thing too. Don't be afraid to leave early if you need to. If you ask anyone who's ever had a public meltdown, they will tell you, trust me, it's not worth it. Just go home. Go home and rest. So I do try very hard to minimize exposure to environments that are cause sensory distress. I would recommend, you know, like I said earlier, I don't go places when they're busy. I don't go to peak hours. I avoid the rush. I shop online. Why torture myself? And when I do have to go out into the world, because I can't just be a hermit and stay at home in my RV all day. Like, I have to go out and do things, and you know, I'm here today. Sensory protection. Protect your senses. Sunglasses, hats. If it was cold in here, I'd probably have a blanket thrown back there somewhere. For your ears, you know, music. A lot of people like to put in music, like that young man said earlier in the team panel. Music is a really big one. Headphones, earplugs, ear defenders, just whatever you need to do to protect yourself. I try to stay regulated. So, movement, it's important for everyone, but I find that it's really important for autistic people. I can't say this enough. I need to move and stem. Please, please, please don't force the autistic people you know to sit still and quiet all day long. And then if you yourself are an autistic person, get up and move, take breaks, even if you have to schedule it or set a reminder to make sure it gets done, do it. And then for everyone, whenever possible, please encourage those around you, autistic or not, to move and stem freely. I try to seek out movement and engage in physical activity regularly. I like a lot of things like hiking, walking, swimming. I've never been really into team sports. Everyone's different. I, I actually know there are some autistic people who do team sports. Believe it or not, uh, it's a nightmare for me. <laughs> music, like I said earlier, music is such a big thing. And even my diagnosing doctor, when I told her, you know, I love music, I listen to music a lot, I sing a lot, she said, keep that up. That's really good for you, especially with anxiety, music. And music really is great stress relief. So my advice would be, dance like nobody's watching, Sing badly and off key because it feels good. Trust me, you do not want to be in a car with me when I'm alone singing. 
it will hurt your ears. But I am having the best freaking time of my life. Okay? And that's what matters. Although, it would be really bad if anyone was hanging out with me and they have the perfect pitch. It would be completely intolerable. So the other thing, unfortunately, overloads do still happen. And so, when you go someplace, I know I'm always scoping it out. Like, okay, where can I go if I need to tuck myself into a quiet corner for a bit and just kind of recalibrate? I've hidden a lot of bathrooms, <laughs> a lot of bathrooms over the years. Uh, but for some people, you know, if you have the auditory sensitivity, those hand dryers, if the bathroom has those hand dryers, that kind of makes it off limits for some people. It's like a joke. Autistic people say, how many hand dryers does it take to frighten an autistic person or frighten, I don't know how many autistic people. One, just one. Uh, another good one I would say is if you drive, because some autistic people don't drive, and I don't drive really in new or busy places. Um, hiding in your car. I love hiding in my car. <laughs> I can turn on my heater or my AC, I have control, I shut my door, I lock my door, I crank up my music. The car is a great sensory bubble where I have control over everything. Uh, so I've been hiding in my car since my since I got my car since my first job. Uh, if you don't drive, depending on the neighborhood and the weather, and if it's safe and good weather, you can go for a walk. Just go out. You know, here if I need to go to, I have to go for a walk around the property. It's a beautiful day. It's a nice place to go walk. And then you know, if I ever do find myself overloaded in public, I'm immediately going to remove. I'll make my way to someplace private. So, my body moves organically if I let it. There are involuntary stims. You like jumping, tapping on things. It's just a natural ebb and flow of my energy. When I'm really happy, my hands, they flap joyously. But when I'm scared, something totally different happens. But these stems are just part of my natural autistic body language. They're me, but I've been teased for them my entire life, <coughs> even now. People say things like, what the heck was that? Or, what's wrong with you? You're acting childish. Calm down. Control yourself. I can hold it all in, but doing so is emotionally taxing. So imagine if you had to spend about 30% of your mental energy maintaining expressions and a bodily posture that is unnatural to you. Like an actor, you know, playing a character in a movie, right? But then that movie is real life. And so every time you go out into the world, you need to pick up that acting mask and put it on. That's what it's like for autistic people who mask their stimming. It's exhausting. Everybody stims. Everybody stims. But autistic people, we stim more. We stim constantly, if people don't shame us for it. And we need to. There are many different types of stims. There are stims for each and every one of the senses. Stims can be more, stims can also be destructive, like skin picking, hand banging, or hair plucking. The less cute stims that people are less willing to talk about, they're real. And I'll get into those later. Some of my stems would be rocking, I'm always toe tapping under a desk, hand flapping, I'm always jumping up and down, lots of little hand stuff. I talk with my hands a lot. They say you're not supposed to do that when you're a public speaker. You're supposed to like put your hands down and be still. That's not gonna happen. No, thank you. Also, like I said, I seek out music. You know, singing, rocking, humming music, listening to the same song on repeat. 
I still do that. It's a great way to relax. So this is a piece that I think a lot of non-autistic people miss when talking about stimming. They just see stimming and they're like, oh, autistic people stim. Okay, they don't, they don't really understand the function behind stimming because stimming actually is a very functional behavior. Stimming regulates energy. And so in a very overwhelming environment, emotional or sensory, you know, when things get too loud, if I start to kind of rock a little bit, some of that excess volume kind of lowers. And then I'm able to focus a bit better on what I need to focus on. For the most part, stimming is natural, helpful, and even healthy. But it's irresponsible not to talk about the dark side and some of those more harmful behaviors. So what are some of those harmful stims? Well, they can be these little things that are easy to hide. You know, um, skin, like ripping the little nail, hang nails off your skin. Uh, I know a girl who uh, plucks hair out of her arms and legs with tweezers. Yeah, it hurts. But you know, you never know once you see them doing it. There are a lot of little things, biting your lips, chewing them. But those more intense harmful stems, the ones like head banging, hitting yourself, scratching yourself until you bleed, and then pulling your hair out like you see in a stereotypical movie when people are really, really stressed, that's a sign, clear sign, of an autistic person in extreme distress. And this is important. This is really important. Because autistic stimming is often an outlet for overload. It's generally in proportion to the current level of sensory or emotional input that's going on. Okay? So because of that, strong stimulus is often used to block out and redirect focus away from another very intense emotion or stimulus. So it has a function. So the stronger you know that, that sensation, the emotion or the stimulus, there's a need to provide, you have to do a stronger stim to cancel that out. So that stim that you're using to cancel it has to be equally or more intense. So you know, how can you help? Remember that, that quiet space I told you about earlier? Same rules apply. Create a nice, calm, sensory safe, quiet space. When someone's at this point, they're really past their breaking point, okay? So you really probably do need to like create the space right where they are if possible because you might not be able to get them somewhere else. Uh, but once you've secured that, that environment and created that safe space, okay, that, there, there's a destructive behavior. You need to redirect that, but that behavior has a function. So remember, that energy has to be redirected somewhere. And, you know, maybe for some people it could be participating in a vigorous physical activity. Some people said jumping on trampoline, running on a treadmill. Uh, maybe, you know, some autistic people say, you know, hey, I used to hit myself in the head. Now instead I punch myself right here. Because I'm it's it's bad, but it's not as bad as like hitting yourself in the head. You could do some damage to yourself hitting yourself in the head. So just remember it's important. And that, that behavior is functional, and it's a sign that something else is going on underneath, okay? There's more than just a see the person hurting themselves. And I also like to look for things that kind of prompt a mental reset. And at our old house, we had a jacuzzi tub. Oh, I miss that jacuzzi tub. We don't have that in the RV. <laughs> it does not, do not get to bring it with us. Uh, another thing, you know, for me that might work for everyone is if you have like a trusted music playlist that you can put on and listen to that for a while, kind of soothe the brain. It's all about soothing and calming everything. So think about what you can do to create a soothing,
calming environment. But then, you know, if, someone, if someone's needing that intenseness, you want to give them a way to get that out to, to, still. You can't just stop them. You got to look at the root of the pain. So, it's really important, you know, to find out what works for your situation. Like I said earlier, make notes, look for patterns, try new things, get creative. For example, here's, here's one of my own. I'm really bad and I've always been about biting my lips until they bleed. I have somewhere around here a chapstick because I wear chapstick and lip gloss. I don't want that in my mouth and I want you to bite my lips. Another one, um, I wash my hands with this horrible soap. I don't like the smell of it. But I've done it on purpose before where I get a soap I don't like the smell of, wash my hands with it. Because like I'll pick at my face unintentionally and realize I'm doing it, or I'll put my hand in my mouth or something, like you know, bite your cuticles. I'm not gonna do that because oh, that soap smells bad. And I'll keep my hand away from my face. So it's just kind of, you know, those little things. Find out what works for you, get creative. Um, but it's really, you know, number one, as you go, go out of here today, remember, I can't stress this enough, each and every autistic person is different. What works for one autistic person may not work for everyone, and what works in one situation may not work for that same person in every situation. Be supportive. If someone is injuring themselves, remember, they're in extreme distress, and they need you more than ever. All right, guys. I have time for questions, and they don't have to be on the presentation. <laughs> I missed the first part of your presentation, I'm sorry, so you might mention this, but did you have any um, indication or around that age or younger that you had? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you did miss a bit, but it's okay. Sorry. Uh, no, no, it's okay. No, I, I did talk a little bit about that early in the presentation. I I had a lot of issues in school, and I got in trouble in school a lot, and the teachers really didn't know what to do with me back then. I, I'm a child of the 90s. So the only thing anyone thought of was ADHD, which wasn't accurate, you know, for me. But there was no idea. You know, people didn't really. Our understanding of autism in the nineties was pretty bad. So, yes, but definitely there were signs. And I think now, if I was growing up right now, I'm pretty sure I would have been diagnosed fairly young. Yeah. Any other questions? That's a good question. The question is, how did I learn to advocate for myself? I think a lot of that came from reading and interacting with other autistic people and seeing how they do and asking their strategies, uh, really immersing myself with other autistic people, especially online. That's, that's really been such a big thing. I'm always torn on this, actually. I think about this a lot. Like, would I, would I want to know? Like, would I wanted to know when I was younger? There's a part of me that's like, gosh, I went almost 30 years thinking, oh, I'm just this broken person, part of normal. Kind of like this ugly duckling story, you know? Oh, I'm an ugly duckling. I'm an ugly duckling. And then I was diagnosed, I'm like, oh, I'm not an ugly duckling. I'm a swan. I'm not, I'm not a broken, non-autistic person. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm totally normal for an autistic person. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But, but it's still, here's the thing though about that, and that, that's a two part question actually, because remember those kids in the panel, did you see in the panel, those teenagers, how they had people telling their parents they're never going to talk, they're never going to do this, that scares me because I know a lot of people who are adults now that say their parents bought into that narrative, and those kids are not in a good place as adults. So I can't really say yes or no. I wouldn't be who I was today if I knew earlier, so maybe not. That's a good question. <laughs> good one, though. Any other? Yes? What do you do 
for the children that are nonverbal and like my daughter, she's like severe to profound autistic and I have a history of autism in my family. Um, I don't know how to deal with her sensory needs, but I can't let her think that going and scratching my hands yeah. and all these different things are going right. to to get her to not, you know. Well, maybe start was, experimenting you know. with some different options for sensory things she can do instead when she starts doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe give her, I don't know, some, something else she can destroy her hand. What about that foam with those little yeah, balls in it? That's or, what, you know? That's what a behavior therapist is having me try to do with Yeah, because she still needs, there's that, there's that need for that energy to go out. Yeah. So you can't just distinguish, extinguish the behavior. Because that there's a need for that, but help help find something that works for her. Mm -hmm. That's more healthy. And it might take a while to find a bunch of different things to find yeah. out what that is. That's what the behavior therapist said to me. Mm -hmm. It's going to take a while. Yeah, I mean, I it took me a while after I was diagnosed, and you know, I'm a, I'm a 30 year old adult, and I had other people to help me figure it out online. So mm -hmm. it's not a simple situation, unfortunately. Yeah. No. <laughs> Do you feel like after diagnosed as an adult, did, did it, a, a therapist help you really cope with that at all since you've already been coping? Um, no, I I didn't go to therapy. I think therapy can be really great and helpful for a lot of people though. I've had people say lots of really good things about going to therapy. She was impressed with a lot of the things I cope with. I probably could have used some therapy back then, but I was still <laughs> so like, Oh, there's nothing wrong with me, and I had I got an anxiety diagnosis with it as well, and I was like, I don't have anxiety. You know, I was I was. It took me a while to really let that all sink in, and by the time it sunk in, I kind of already found other autistic people, and they're kind of like therapy in a lot of ways. So you feel like finding that adult community was more helpful than. Yeah, like you know how earlier you know they were saying the panel, the kids, it's helpful because people they know other people live and experience it too. It's like oh. I'm not, because I, you know, when you're late diagnosed and you don't know you're autistic, you kind of think, oh, there, there's all these, I'm a weirdo, there's nothing wrong with me, I don't know, and you think that you are just this freak that has all these weird quirks about you that nobody else can relate to, and then when you're diagnosed and you start talking to other autistic people, you're like, oh, whoa, you have, well, most of you have a lot of the same quirks I have, we're really similar, and it's like, oh, wow, okay. I'm not, I'm not a weirdo. Okay. You know, that's empowering. It's really healing. Because I, I think, and that helps with that self acceptance thing. Because I needed that so bad. I really didn't even like myself for a lot of years, honestly. Yeah. Sorry, I need to jump in on something that Stephen said that you like yourself better now. Oh. You're really impressive. Oh, gosh. Thank you. Um, My, my, strong, my word of advice would be, try to teach her to advocate for herself. Do your best to do that so that when she's ready, she can do that on her own, because she's going to need to learn that eventually one way or the other. Um, and, you know, when you're helping her advocate, you know, say, you know, I disclose autism in my job interviews. And I, you know, I have a recent video up on, on Facebook. And, you know, what I say is, you know, I'm autistic. And you know, X, Y, and Z, these are the things I can do for you, but this is what I need in return to be able to do my job at optimal efficiency. You know, or that, you know, I just need you to give a little so that I can do this, this, and this for you. So I, you know, it's I never paint autism. It's not something wrong. It's just I've got a little bit of a different thing going on, and I just need a little help so that I can do everything you know that's expected of me. It's just a little bit of a give from some people.
Not for me. No. no. Well, and the other thing is, I work from home a lot right now. I need accommodations for the workplace, and without that, without disclosing that, I can't get accommodations. So. Too, that they like maybe like scribbling really hard with a crayon until the whole page is gone. Yeah. Just like color, just like, like <laughs> you know, it's that same, real intense. You don't want to do with a pen or something like break right. or a marker, might squish it. Yes. And also, don't wait until they've reached the point where they're really doing it hard no. or doing something really hard and try to substitute at that moment. Anticipate mm -hmm. when they might have those needs and give them things before. Yeah, uh, an experiment before and people might prevent getting to, sorry, getting to that stage. No, that's great. No, that's true. That's not yeah. talking about learning to watch for those signs, those first signs. You know, from the inside out, for me, that's like, okay, am I starting to feel a little bit vibrating? It's hard to say. Like, it's like so much energy is vibrating from the inside of me. I'm like, uh, 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 you know, okay, I need to go take a break. Yes. You say you work from home a lot. Do you, are you self employed or do you? How did you carve out a, a unique spot for yourself in terms of your skills and your job? Because, and I say, I hear you say you disclose, and I wonder, can that be a deal breaker sometimes? Have you sensed that when you disclose that? I'm not, well, I, I, I've not been diagnosed for a lot of years. I stick in one job for a long time. So I haven't had a lot of jobs since I was diagnosed. Um, I was very lucky. I would say a lot of this is luck. Because I also sit on the board for a charity called NeuroGuides. And I kind of whispered, hey, I'm looking, you know, to, to the owner of the charity. And he connected me with another board member and said, you need this person. And so we met and we talked. And she has experience with autistic people. So she knows. Uh, so I, I just, it's been incredibly lucky. Uh, and it, a lot of that too was, you know, I can do all this for you. It's the same kind of thing. Like this is what I need. I need to work from home, but I can I can work 50 hours a week sometimes. You know, if, if I'm at home, if you need me to go to the office, I can't work 50 hours a week. I'm gonna be burnt out, and I'm gonna need to work a lot less. So are you using technology? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Writing? Yeah. Yeah. So okay. um, I've got my laptop here, and. Um, I use my cell phone that's over there for business calls, and I have a time tracker app called Harvest, so I clock in on my computer remotely. And that's the thing, I came in and I said, I can work from home, these are my solutions, this is how I'll clock in, I'll, tra I'll track it by the minute. If you watch that, I don't want to hear by the minute when you're doing that's too much, but you know? So it's kind of alleviating a little bit of those fears sometimes for business owners because they're like, is this going to be harder for me? It's like, not really. I just need a little bit from you. And I'll make it like that, I promise. <laughs> but I have really great um, supportive coworkers I love my team that I work with. <laughs> Any questions? Yes? Do you um, travel and talk to schools and teachers? And because what I find is even, I'm embarrassed to say that I'm the OT in school. I'm not embarrassed, I love this job. Um, at a school for children with special needs, severe teaching problems. And I feel as Very, very lovingly and with all good intentions, they're like, I can't keep taking him out. He needs to learn how to do this. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, he, he can't do it right now. So I almost feel like as much as I, I sort of have this this pretend degree in a way, because I just love my job and I get paid to do great fun things with kids, and I just happen to have the blessing of a degree to go with it. But even though I am supposedly the expert in this area. I feel like they don't want to hear it. They want, and I, I see things.
things from different perspectives, and I know from a teacher's perspective, they must learn to sit and do these things. Mm -hmm. They must have the music on because that's what kids need and love. But it's too loud right now. Mm -hmm. She can't handle it. Mm -hmm. But she can't run the classroom here. I'm like, but and I feel like I wish I could have yeah, a person with insight you know? yeah. to come and tell them, this is who I am, and I'm telling you from a person who feels with it, that this is how maybe you should change your way of thinking. I'll come talk to anyone as long as they don't want me to pay for my own airfare. <laughs> you know, as long as someone's willing to pay the travel, I can't afford to fly myself all over the country. But I, I do. I'll, I go where I'm needed. I, I'm from Texas. I'm not from here. I flew, I, I left my house at 1 a.m. yesterday to catch a plane and got here at way too early, 30 yesterday morning. It's been a, it's been a wild weekend. But yeah, I, I know where I'm needed. <laughs> and I have a blog, um, the Neurodivergent Rebel blog. It's neurodivergentrebel.com. So if you want to share any of this, I have I do videos. I put out new videos pretty much every Wednesday. Um, so there's a lot of content. If you enjoy the content in this presentation today, check out the videos. And I share, if you, if you follow me on Facebook, I'll share other autistic voices a lot and autistic, autism positive news. And then, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, and I'm on Twitter. The only one that's a little bit different, it's Neurodivergent Rebel everywhere except Twitter, it's just NeuroRebel. They wouldn't let me make my name that long on Twitter. So, connect with me there. I appreciate you all. We're, we're over time.